Good evening. Happy 4th of July. Is it hotter than the 4th of July? It is the 4th of July. All right. Our topic this evening is in body. Uh, welcome to our in-house summer series where we were using some of our own preachers and teachers to present uh, various topics of empower and enrich and in body and servant spirit that you see on the banners in front of you. Uh, Gary Lynn is scheduled for next Wednesday evening, and that is 7-11-2018, which is a significant day in my wife's life. Note, note, note. Tonight uh, we will cover in body and... I didn't get the clicker, did I? Do you have the clicker? Okay. We'll go to the next slide anyway. Philippians 3.1. It is no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again and a safeguard for you. I don't have that much to say, and when I say it, I say it you might hear some things I've said before. That is not a burden to me, and it's a safeguard for you. And Paul said so right there, okay? <laughs> the other thing about that verse is that we're talking about in body. Tim presented on in body just three weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, Richard well, on June 20th. And Richard Davis will make a run at the same topic of in body on August 28th. Ooh. Okay. Some of you may not know, and here's another one of those repeat things. My name is David Maynard. We've been with the Broken Arrow Church since about 2000. Uh, my wife, Elaine, is a licensed occupational therapist, and I am a licensed mental health therapist. She works in the quality department at St. John's Broken Arrow and St. John's Owasso. And I work for community care, HMO, or no, health. We do more than HMOs anymore. So, it's an insurance company, and I work in the behavioral health department. Neither one of us, Elaine or I, are on the front line of doing patient care anymore, but we are kind of in the back headquarters managing other people that are doing those works. So that's a little bit about who and what we are. Our oldest daughter, Kayla, is a social worker, works for the Department of Human Services, saving one child at a time each day. Our, uh, she is married to Chris, who is also a social worker, and he is saving a child one day at a time in an adolescent and child partial hospitalization program here in Tulsa. Our son, Evan, is a petroleum engineer and lives in Plano, Illinois. Illinois. That's, that's Freudian, sorry. My grandparents used to live in Plano, Illinois. Okay? One excuse as good as another. Plano, Texas. And he is married to Rebecca, also known as Rebecca Dolan, and part of the Dolan clan. And they have one child, Jack. Jack Maynard, who is, was born in November of 2017. So he is the joy of our little life right now. Questions or comments about who and what we are? I am thankful and grateful for the book of James and for the Sermon on the Mount and for the book of Proverbs because they are what we call in my profession uh, loose associations. You start in the book of James and he tells you what he's going to talk about, but then they're all kind of related a little bit to each other. And so my best illustration is, does anybody know why fire trucks are red? Okay, I will tell you why fire trucks are red, and this is an illustration of loose associations. 
2 plus 2 is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. And there are 12 inches in a ruler. And the great ruler was Queen Elizabeth. And Queen Elizabeth sailed the seven seas. And the seas have fish, and the fish have fins. And the fins fought the Russians, and the Russians are red. That's why fire trucks are red, because they're always Russian. Very loose association, okay? Sometimes in my teaching, you'll find that same type of approach. There'll be some things that you go, where in the world is he going with that? And I will loosely associate them with something else. We want to talk about being embodied. What do you think of when you hear the word embody? It's in there, okay? Personified. Yes, we're going to use personification this evening. What else do you think of in embody? Manifested. Okay? Embody. Think of, pardon me? Prego, because it's in there. I was going with body snatchers because they're embodied, you know, aliens, you know, embodied in those type of things. Pardon me? Oh, if you're enabled to, to do something, then, I mean, if you're, you're embodied to do something, you're kind of given the power and the authority to do something, okay? Any, any uh, remembrance of anything that Tim suggested a couple of weeks ago? Something that struck you that you can still remember? This is a test on Tim's teaching. Right here. He used the word personify. Okay. He talked about we are embedded with or embody the spirit. Okay. What else? Tim? We are embodied spirits. Okay. Personify, emulate, represent. Representation of an abstract idea into a concrete concept. Okay? The whole world of psychology is these abstract ideas that somebody comes along and puts some concrete terms to or constructs to to try to explain behavior. Uh, each one of these theorists and uh, Psychologists had their different theories about different things. They would take these abstract thoughts and ideas of attachment and bring them down into some concrete terms and things like that. All right, here's the question. Who was your childhood hero? Superman was, okay. Anybody else besides those on the screen? What were some of your childhood heroes? Mickey Mantle. Okay. Roy Rogers. The Lone Ranger. Zorro. Pardon me? Nomin okay. The gymnast person from Russia. Okay. Female. Okay. Pardon me? Batman. Okay. Did any of you ever act those out? Put that bath towel on your neck and you would go flying through the house, you know, because you were Superman and uh, those type of things. We act out oftentimes a hero. Somebody say Mickey Mantle, okay? I, m when my son was playing baseball, I noticed these guys would step into the back and they would do this and then they would prepare to bat. Why were all these little kids doing this when they stepped into the... Okay, officially it's you know, telling the umpire, now give me time to get in. Okay, But who in the professional realm was doing that every time? Derek Jeter. Derek Jeter, always. Whether he looked at the umpire or not, he did this, and then he stepped into the batter's box. 
and those kids were emulating their hero, what they really wanted. So here's some insight to David Maynard. Some of my childhood heroes were Lloyd Bridges of Sea Hunt and the men of Ripcord. Anybody remember those shows? Okay. We had a scuba mask that I would put on at the house and I would get on top of the sofa and I would act like I, or in Sea Hunt, they would put those big old tanks on and they would sit at the edge of the boat and then they would just fall back into the water. You remember that? So anytime I was at the pool, what did I do? I got on the edge of the pool and went whoosh and I'd get this back blister over here. Right? But they were hitting it with tanks and stuff like that. Ripcord. Uh, my sister and I, we acted it out so much that she made me an embroidered patch <laughs> of a parachute that these guys on Ripcord always had. And we would lay in the floor with our hands out like we were falling through space. And that was just cool. They're still on my bucket list. I hope to jump out of a perfectly good airplane someday and do some scuba diving, okay? Uh, I would emulate them. I would act them out. Uh, maybe you played Cowboys and Indians or Will Rogers and had pistols and you had all these kinds of... Did anybody ever act out Jesus Christ when they were a little kid? You did. Do what? Played Mary, okay? Now, why was it that we didn't ever do that? Maybe it was out of sacredness, right? Uh, you just didn't, you just didn't do that, okay? But when we're talking about embodying, we're talking about personifying Jesus Christ, right? Acting him out. How can we go about acting him out? Uh, it's interesting that we didn't, you know, I could... I never was able to walk on water, so that couldn't act that out, right? Uh, sit there with loaves of bread and fish and multiply them out and things like that. But the miraculous things I don't think we can act out, but what were some components of Jesus' life that we could act out, things that we can do? Did you ever imitate Bible characters besides Jesus, though? Okay, Bible Hour people, yes, you did. Yes, you've acted out those characters. Maybe played David and Goliath. Okay, some of those things. <laughs> there were times I wished that I could have parted the sea. You know, I acted like Moses and parted the Red Sea, those type of things. Philippians 3.17. Join with others in following my example. Join with others and follow my example. Who's speaking here? Who Paul is. He's writing to the Philippians and he's saying, hey, imitate me. Follow my example, brothers, and note those who live according to the pattern we gave you we gave you okay that's kind of a bold statement isn't it you need to follow my pattern you need to follow my example well that only asks what what was your what was your example if you if we stay in philippians and back up to verse 7 and 8 paul says but whatever was my profit I now consider loss for the sake of Jesus Christ. What is more, I consider everything loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Lost all things. Okay. I want to describe somebody here, and you tell me who I'm talking about. 
He was born in the Middle East. He was raised by a family that, a prominent family. They had, they weren't exceedingly rich and they weren't poor either, okay? He was taught by the finest teachers of his era in his religion of the day, okay? He was taught by the finest. He became concerned by the way his religious religion was going. He became so emphatic about it that he became violent against anybody that opposed his religion. Who might I be talking about? We think of Paul and what a hero he is, and he is. But maybe this gives us another insight of how diverse or how paradoxical this man was to the Jews. Yes, Saul of Tarsus was born in the Middle East. Yes, he was raised in a, evidently an affluent family. He was taught by Gamaliel, one of the best teachers noted in the history books. He became concerned about the way the Jewish religion was going, or the Jewish faith, the Jewish people, to the point that he became violent against those people that opposed him, seeking out the Christians and having them killed or arrested or something like that. So when Paul makes this great change, we, would we consider bin Laden coming and preaching Jesus Christ? That would be quite, quite the coup, wouldn't it? Okay. But where did Paul learn this attitude of losing everything? He was taught by the best. He had the best. He, he believed in being a Jew, and the Jews were the best. But he learned this attitude from Christ. In Philippians 2, 5, and 6, it says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Whose attitude? Mine. Okay? Paul's writing to the Philippians, but he's also writing to me. My attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be held on to, to be grasped. Okay? Like Paul, we need to let it all go. Need to let it all go. He goes on to say, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That's, that's pretty high orders. If I'm to embody Jesus Christ, I need to humble myself, and be obedient even unto death. Obedient unto death. That's a hard, hard order, isn't it? But the good news is because Jesus came, he humbled himself, he was obedient, then therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Okay, does that just apply to Jesus Christ? No, the good news, you are included. Because if we go to the book of Ephesians, in chapter 2 and verse 6, we see that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. That's the good news. If we humble ourselves and if we are obedient, we too shall be exalted. That is great news. But how do you do that? What does that look like is the phrase I like to ask. What does this obedient unto death really look like? How do we together do this? Any suggestions? Anybody got a magic formula? 
Kiss smiles. Okay. We need to follow the example of Christ. Okay. Okay. In order to follow that example, we have to find out what that example is, right? Okay. I'm going to suggest that we have three areas to work on. How do we do that? We have to get our heart right, we have to get our head right, and we have to get our body right. Now you say, wait a minute. Okay, I need to make a disclaimer. A lot of my material is plagiarized from other people. Okay, so I'm not, don't take, I don't not take credit from this. Some of this is from Chris. Some of this is from my son. Some of this is from my son-in-law. So uh, there's my disclaimer. So giving credit to where credit is due. So how do we get a right heart? How do we get the right head? And how do we get the right body? Those sound like, oh, okay, he's talking about cardiovascular exercise and he's talking about mental gymnastics and he's talking about some physical weightlifting to get your body right okay I want to suggest a different taking a abstract idea and making it concrete what I was really fascinated with in our recent study of the love story series is that they took big chunks of the Bible at one time, okay? And one of the lessons covered the prison epistles, okay? That's Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. But when you look at those first, those three of Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, you start making bigger labels for them, okay? Let's look at this one. When you look at the big picture, when you look at the book of Philippians, the book of Philippians is your heart book, okay? This is the love letter of the New Testament. This is the thank you note that Paul writes, and it is full of heartfelt desire for the Philippians, okay? When you look at the book of Colossians, Colossians is about the supremacy of Christ. The supremacy of Christ. A tapestry, you know, Christ him in verse 15. Uh, the mystery of Christ. No one take you captive because... Christ is the head of the church. And then when you go to the book of Ephesians, you find there that this is the spiritual blessings in Christ. And when they're talking about being in Christ, they're talking about the church and being in the church and what the church. So if we get our heart right, and if we get our head right, who the real leader of our 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 life is, and if we get our relationship with the body right, then we too can embody Jesus Christ and be more like him. Thoughts, questions? Again, loose associations, but I think you can follow where I'm headed, okay? Also, the book of Hebrews does a lot about this head part identifying the superiority of Jesus Christ to any other type of religion, okay? Quit saying okay. So what do you need to do to get your heart right? Let's try to be as practical as possible about getting your heart right. My assignment for you is to read the book of Philippians with the focus of the heart. Read the book of Philippians with the focus of what kind of attitude 
was Paul taking with these Philippian people? What kind of thinking was he using with these Philippian people? What kind of heart did he show? He showed them that he loved them. He showed them the heart of Christ and that he gave he, the kenosis him in chapter 2 about how he emptied himself. Okay. So prayer is the answer to our heart problems. Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart. Okay. Each one of these three letters that we're looking at, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, all of them have a prayer in them. And look at those prayers of what Paul prays for these people. He prays for their attitude. He prays for their mind. He prays for their behavior, those type of things. So what in the world do I mean by consult? Pardon me? Okay. But I think there's a valuable resource that we don't consult with often enough, and that's each other. Okay, when's the last time you asked somebody else, how do, how, do you, how do you pray? When do you sit down and pray? How have you found your prayer life changing over time? How did you get through little kids and still have a prayer life? How did you get through older life and still have a prayer life? We talk and consult with one another and looking at this audience, you guys are the ones to be consulted. But we need not just sit there and wait for somebody to come along and ask you. How can you work that into your conversation about, well, this morning when I got to work and I opened up my prayer journal and wrote down, I wrote your name because you came to mind. Wow, you just taught me several things. You taught me about setting a specific time and a place and having some kind of specific activity that you did that helps you with your prayer life. And we've talked about journals. There, there are other ways of doing it. Uh, there's as many people in here, different ways of doing it. But are we talking about it? Are we asking each other about it? Are we sharing with one another what some of the struggles that we might have or the great successes, okay? Oh, I don't want to be that personal. I don't want to air my dirty laundry. Well, maybe there's some clean laundry to air too, okay? Hey, this, I found this book to be very, very helpful in my prayer life. I, I enjoy having prayerful thoughts while I'm running in the morning. I also enjoy having a journal that I write things down in. I also enjoy having a specific time when I get to work, and I choose to get to work early because you never can predict what the Broken Arrow Expressway is going to be like in the morning. So I get there early. So I set a time and a place. So let me ask you, anybody willing to share what they do? Is it an evening ritual? First thing in the morning. Okay. Five o'clock, there's no interruptions. Agreed. I enjoy that early morning time. Okay. My wife is on a different clock. She enjoys that late night, no interruptions. Everybody else has gone to bed and she's got her time, okay? My time, and, and to say that I, this is the only way to do it, that's why I encourage you to talk about it. Just consult with one another. What is working, what's not working, so you can move along, okay? Let's move on. You'll see some repetitiveness in this. So how do you get your head right? I would encourage you to read the book of Colossians with that focus in mind. The headship of Jesus Christ. 
the superiority of Jesus Christ. As stated earlier, the book of Hebrews is also very powerful in identifying that. Read the Gospels. Read the Bible. Okay? Jim talked about you can't emulate something that you don't have any knowledge of. So you need to be reading those Gospels. What is it that Jesus did? When I was a little kid, I was told never to mark in my Bible. I'm marking it all the time now. The Gospel of Matthew, who was it written to? It was written to the Jews, and it predominantly says what Jesus said. The writings of Matthew are a lot about what Jesus said. Okay. Then you go to the Gospel of Mark. It is more of to a Roman audience and it is more about what Jesus did, what it is that Jesus did. Sometimes it's called the Gospel of Peter, and it's 7% unique. Luke. Luke is focused on the Holy Spirit and women in prayer. Okay. This is also called the sinner's gospel. And when you look to the gospel of John, Jesus is divine. Jesus' deity is what the focus is at. So you can kind of line those up and you can learn more about each aspect of Jesus by reading through those different gospels. Let's move quickly, right? And how do you read? Are you a great reader and you love just reading? You hand me a book and within five minutes I'm asleep. Okay? Reading is difficult for me. It's not impossible. Some people, it is difficult for me. Spent the third grade go into reading clinic, we're going to a different building, doing, uh, reading is difficult for me, but I can hear all day long, okay? So I find that listening to scripture on the way to work and back is the best way for me to get that in. There are Bible apps, there are reading schedules, there are, again, consult with one another, what are you doing to get the word in you? Let's see, the next one is, how do you get your body right? Read the book of Ephesians with the thoughts of the body of Christ, the church. It requires fellowship. To This whole consulting part is, is fellowshipping, right? Finding out about how we do those type of things. That's, all of three of these have to be intentional, and planned and purposeful, right? You've got to plan them out. If you plan to be in fellowship with the church body, it takes some planning. Hey, we're going to plan a dinner Sunday after church. We are going to intentionally invite some people we don't know and bring them to our... That takes planning, being intentional. Having these cassettes ready or the disc cassettes. Having the disc ready, having the MP3 player with the Bible to listen to it takes some preparation and planning. Okay, let's move on. Prayer takes care of your heart. Reading takes care of your head and identifies the head of the church that you're following, that you're emulating. Fellowship takes care of the body. We're imitating, we're personifying Christ, we are copying, we are following what he is doing. We're back to where we started. Join with others in following my example. And note those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Take note of some people. Go ask them how they do it. When Kevin Lawrence called me up one time and says, hey, I want to go to lunch. Okay, we were downtown, we eat lunch, and he says, how did you raise your kids? Your kids seem to be doing pretty good. How did you do that? Well, uh, you married the right woman first. 
sometimes those questions need to be asked. And if we see somebody that's doing something that we really would like to, Paul says they're following an example that we can share with one another and help each other along the process. And we don't have time for the video. Thank you very much. The second bell rang. It, it's, it's a loose association. Go for it. Robert, please. If you need to go pick up a child, please do so. I want you to take note of this and this. Okay? Go ahead and start it and try to stop it at about 15 seconds in. Right there. Okay, stop. Do you see that orange shirt down there? Down there at the bottom? You see that white cap? That's Elaine next to me. And uh, Evan and Rebecca and Kayla. Okay. Everything I see in the world, go ahead and start the rest of it. I have a hard time not looking at it through spiritual eyes, okay? This is a wreck at the Indianapolis 500 in 2017 that is Scott Dixon that is uh, right in front of us. Notice the trucks, how fast they get there, okay? They're immediately upon him. They're checking him out. They're going to find out. Uh, with the sound on, you will see that there is the crowd is cheering, not because that he wrecked, because he's getting up and walking out of that. Okay, we're going to see some slow motion video of this wreck that is going to. If you're not into wrecks, don't look. Okay, Jay Howard was the cause of this wreck. That's Scott Dixon. He's being taken to the care center as per routine. That's Jay Howard. And he's uh, getting out and just shaken up, but not injured. Pardon me? <laughs> no, they're not. The guys in the baby blue are uh, doctors. Okay, they're going to point out to you Jay Howard. He is in the top. He's in what they call the gray area. You can see the dark path. That is the narrow path. He was in the wide path. And at that point, they say he is totally out of control. Does he look out of control to you? Not to me, but he does. He hits the wall, and there's Scott in the wrong place at the wrong time, and he hits the wall. Okay. They're doing about 200 miles an hour. The area in which he hit and the, the area to which he stopped is about half a mile. Okay, so he's sliding for half a mile, and he's sliding right in front of us. Also, you see how his hands go up, and he lets go of the steering wheel. Okay. That's enough, Robert. The things that I wanted to point out is sometimes we see people getting into the gray area that don't need to be there. They are totally out of control. They know they're out of control, but it needs somebody like us to say, hey, buddy, you're out of control. You, we, you need to come back in, okay? And then when it does get out of control, there is an accident, the safety crew is there immediately. They hurried, okay? You want to take care of them. Scott Dixon was encased in what they call a tub. That thing, they were embodied. They were in Christ, and that's the thing that saved his life, was he was in there, strapped in, and he was taken care of. That's the beauty of the church. That's the beauty of Christ. That's the beauty illustrated by that tub, that no matter what happens outside of it, is still going to protect you and keep you safe. That's all I got.